Thank you very much, Florence. And uh, what a pleasure to be here at the FCC Hong Kong. Uh, as a member of the FCC T in Thailand, um, I've often wanted to come here, and uh, this is my first uh, time to be here. And I've, I've not only got new friends here and people I recognize from around my journalistic exploits in the region, um, but some really old friends. In fact, one of them just came up to me and said, Len, I don't think we'd seen each other for 30 years. So um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as, as Florence points out, I'm, I'm um, based in Bangkok. I'm covering this region. Uh, for Channel 4 News, and um, when I was well, when I was appointed to the post about uh, almost exactly three years ago, in fact, um, the the, the um, it just coincided with with the rise of uh, Rodrigo Duterte. He, he he came from nowhere. He was he was an insurgent outsider politician, and um, people in the Philippines didn't really even know who he was, and, and you know except if they came from the southern island of Mindanao, where he had been the mayor of a city there called Davao for uh, 22 years, seven terms. And um, they knew him down there all right, because he made quite a reputation for himself. But he wasn't much covered. There was a, there was a, there was a sort of landmark piece in Time magazine way back in the late 80s, which, 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 which called him the enforcer. Um, and there were a few other pieces of, of, of very good journalism over the years, but not that much. And so when I began to dig into him a bit, I thought, you know, as a journalist wants to research his subject matter before he goes and covers a story, I realized pretty quickly that there wasn't much there. And it was at that point I decided I'll be the man who does, who does that. And, I, and that's the, the, the rationale behind the book. Just so that you know, I know he's in your backyard as much as he is in mine um, in Thailand, but the, the Philippines, um, you know, it, it doesn't get an awful lot of international coverage. And, you know, Duterte did get a lot to start with when he started killing people, a lot of people. Um, but it became so commonplace and run of the mill that he sort of fell off the journalistic agenda. And so there hasn't been that much coverage of late. But I can assure you that it carries on to this day. The killings carry on just as they had. And, and just to, to, to let you know a little bit about him by way of introduction, basically, he, he you know, 30 years had, had, had gone by since that uh, famous people power revolution in which Marcos fled into exile and Cory Aquino came to power. And 30 years is more than a generation in the Philippines. Um, and people had quite simply forgotten what it was like to live under a dictatorship. And in swept this character, who, who, who came from nowhere, as I said, and he had this rough-edged appeal. He spoke the language of the poor. He, he, he used absolutely disgusting language, expletive after expletive, and made people laugh. And, Pete, and he told great stories, and he, and he promised to get rid of problems that, you know, that ordinary Filipinos felt were really troubling them. You know, the, the, the drugs that were everywhere. He completely overinflated the numbers. In fact, Australia turns out to have a worse crystal meth addiction problem than the Philippines. But he inflated the numbers from about 1.8 million, according to his dangerous drugs board, who'd sometimes taken a few tokes of crystal meth. And by, by, by within a few months, it was 5 million. So, so he, he, he convinced the Philippines that they had a drugs pandemic on their hands. He, he also talked up about cleaning up cr crime and corruption. And corruption was a real problem in the Philippines and remains so. Um, and these, these promises struck. And here was this guy who, 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 who promised wonderful things. Um, and um, and, and it was, there, there were things that Filipinos felt really mattered to them. And they just believed him. And there was something about his language, his, 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 his ordinariness, that was so different from, from the previous occupants of Malacanang Palace. Some, somehow, they, they, they seized on this, and he won by a landslide. In, 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 in June 2016, Rodrigo Duterte was voted in with 16.5 million votes, which was the highest number of votes ever in a pres presidential election in the Philippines, other than when Marcos actually um, stole, stole an election. Um, but, but Duterte played to the politics of anxiety. Now that's a term you'll hear in relation to authoritarian populists anywhere and everywhere. Donald Trump plays to the poli politics of anxiety, as does Viktor Orban in Hungary, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, 
Modi in India. They're all over the place, but Duterte was described by a Filipino congressman who's now an analyst and, and academic called Walden Bello as a fascist original. And that's why I found him particularly in interesting, because he, he encapsulates the very worst that authoritarian populism can deliver. He is as the guy on the screen here, Matt Fry, who spent many years as a, as a correspondent for the, for the BBC uh, here in Hong Kong. He's the Asia correspondent. He now works for Channel 4 News with me. And Matt, Matt and I were talking about Duterte one day. And he said, my god, he's just like Trump's inner demon. Duterte is Trump unleashed. He, he, he's what Trump would be if there were no constraints on him at all. And he, he set about well, first of all, promising that he'd kill people, and then delivering, as Florence said, on those promises. Within six months, within two months, 2,000 people were dead. Most of them urban poor, drug addicts, petty criminals, street kids. Within six months, 6,000 people were dead. Within 18 months, 12,000. And now, Although the police no longer give the right sort of statistics because it's like comparing apples and oranges with, with, with the statistics they put out and nobody's quite sure, but independent estimates and opposition politicians and human rights groups believe that as many as 20,000 Filipinos have been killed by Rodrigo Duterte or under, under, under his government. That is the largest loss of civilian life in Southeast Asia since Pol Pot. So, this is why this guy is important. He represents a trend, and he's the worst of that trend. And he has sought not only to kill people, but to undermine the tenets of Asia's oldest democracy. I was having an argument with a friend of mine who's a Sunday Times correspondent in, in, in Bangkok, um, and we're, we're, we're great friends, and he was in Sri Lanka this past weekend, and he, he did a piece on, on, on Sri Lanka and called it Asia's oldest democracy. And, it, and, and it's true, you know, there was universal suffrage was introduced in, 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 in Sri Lanka in uh, 1931. Well, the Philippines goes back way, way, way to the beginning of the, of, of the 20th century, and, it, and it's, 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 it was founded on, on real genuine democratic principles, and what Duterte has done is singularly undermine each of these in turn, and I've, and I've just taken a note of what, what he's actually done. Um, if you can, you can run through them. He, you know, the first thing he did is he, is he, he started to um, reinvent, rehabilitate Marcos and his clan. He, he, he allowed his, his, the, the, the old dictator's reburial in Manila, and, and his, um, Marcos's son, Bong Bong, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., is now contesting the results of the vice presidency and could yet be allowed to become vice president of the Supreme, by, by, by the Supreme Court. Now, if that happens, and Duterte is sort of like getting on, he's about 72, 73 years old, and, and if, if he were to die in office, and Bong Bong or Ferdinand Marcos Jr. does get in, you know, Filipinos could one day wake up to find themselves ruled by another Ferdinand Marcos, which would come as a bit of a shock to some. Um, now, Duterte owns Congress, and by that I mean like when he introduced martial law across the southern Philippines, there had been so many defections to his party out of the opposition and other parties that, that, that it was this, this declaration of martial law, which was, which was an enormous thing for the Philippines, because it was the first time this had happened really since, since, since Marcos, and, and memories run deep of that time. Um, it was voted in, in favor of, that, of, of martial law by 245 votes to 14. That's the degree to which he owns Congress. He owns the military, he owns the police, he, um, he jailed his chief critic, Leila de Lima, congresswoman. He's recently uh, tried to arrest uh, another of his critics, uh, Sonny Trinianis, who, who, who has spoken out very bravely and vociferously against some of Duterte's policies. Uh, he has sought to militarize the government. So that, like, just, just last week, he, 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 he turned over the Bureau of Customs to the military. And many see that as the thin end of the, end of the wedge. Um, he has ousted the Philippine Chief Justice and is stuffing the Supreme Court with his cronies. He has attacked the media, he's locked horns with the Catholic Church, and uh, perhaps worst of all, he has normalized killing. And I just want to spin a quick story here, which I reported last year in the Philippines. It, it, it's, it's about a year ago, um, but 
nothing much has changed. And it just gives you a little flavor of, A, what I do as a, as, as a correspondent, but also um, it just sort of upsums what Duterte had come to represent uh, less than two years into his presidency. So if we run that quickly, it's only about five minutes, and uh, then I'll just uh, make a few other remarks. Thank you. Oh, do I do it from here? Oh, sorry. Start somewhere. I, okay. That was the deadliest night in a deadly war on drugs. As Philippine police killed 32 people alleged of being involved in the drugs trade, the highest death toll in a single day of police operations since President Duterte took office. Amnesty International declared the shootings in Bulacan province had plumbed new depths of bar barbarity. But the president was unrepentant. If we can kill another 32 every day, he said, maybe we can reduce what ails this country. This report from our Asia correspondent Jonathan Miller in the Philippines does contain some distressing footage. Please tell to the whole world, help us, please help me. Marie Flo's son is dead. It's not a dog, my son. It's not a dog or a pig to be like them. Shot by cops in a nightly back alley bloodbath. This is the Philippines' war on drugs, a reign of terror licensed by the president himself, where death squads roam the slums and cops shoot to kill. 10,000 dead in a year, most dirt poor. The 32 people shot by police in raids on Monday night alone in a province just north of Manila was their bloodiest night so far. Many more will have been killed in hits by masked men on motorbikes, as they are every night. Sick of lily-livered liberals in government, 16 million Filipinos voted Rodrigo Duterte into office. He loves guns and girls and motorbikes, swears at foreign leaders, claims to have killed men himself, cracks jokes about rape, and speaks in unvarnished language. President Rodrigo Orcuat Duterte, Republic of the Philippines. As a local mayor, they called him Duterte Harry after Clint Eastwood's shoot first, ask questions later cop. As president, that's what he ordered his cops to do. Suspects on watch lists are gunned down in supposed police shootouts or assassinated by vigilante killers who whistleblowers claim are mostly cops off duty. Today, Duterte Harry's pinning medals on chests and promising he'll watch their backs. If you have to shoot, shoot them dead. And this what is uh, the human rights idiots are trying to complain. You know, when I say I shoot them dead, I prefer to shoot them in the heart or in the head. If you insist on a drug war, I will kill you all. I will kill you. Buoyed by Donald Trump's praise for the unbelievable job he is doing, Duterte claims the Philippines is a narco state in the throes of a drugs pandemic. I will kill you if you destroy my country. He's a populist authoritarian with an iron fist. He does not brook defiance, and his grip on this country of 100 million people is tightening. President Duterte has a strong man swagger. It's a sort of godfather charisma, which Filipinos like to call his gangster charm. During his turbulent first year in office, he has declared martial law across the southern Philippines. He has intimidated and attacked his critics in the judiciary, in the opposition, in the media and the church. And his chief critic, his most, most outspoken critic, Senator Leila de Lima, languishes in a jail cell about a hundred yards from here, inside police headquarters. Leila de Lima, you're, you're former accused, human rights commissioner turned justice secretary, is, a is Duterte's nemesis. Now, depending on who you believe, you could be arrested shortly. Oh yes. Have you been expecting this? Yeah, I've been expecting the word. 
worse already. You know, they're, they're capable of, of the worst things. Uh, they're gonna force... Delima had investigated his links to a death squad in the city he once ran as mayor, and as a senator, continued to dig into Duterte's violent past and present. He's a very dangerous person and is a dangerous president, but uh, I don't, I, I refuse to be silenced. I refuse to be intimidated. Days later, Delima was arrested on drugs charges and remains locked up inside police HQ, where she is now an Amnesty International prisoner of conscience. Jose Manuel Chel Diocno is the Philippines' leading human rights lawyer, whose father was jailed under the disgraced dictator Ferdinand Marcos 35 years ago. In just one year, he says, Duterte has killed three times as many as Marcos managed in a decade of brutal military rule. The war on drugs is really a pretext for a war on, on law. It's, it's really a war against the rule of law. It, to me, it's a very clear attempt to displace justice from the courts with justice from the barrels of guns. When you have a situation where the legal system is virtually means nothing anymore, then the only kind of government that will be capable of maintaining order in, in the country will have to be some type of authoritarian government. The uh, proclamation of martial law is not a military takeover. It was, though. I... Martial law under Marcos was so long ago that most Filipinos have no memory of what it was like. Duterte called Marcos the best president the Philippines ever had and ordered the corrupt dictator's reburial in the Cemetery of Heroes. As he worked to rehabilitate the Marcos clan, including his supporting an electoral challenge which could yet see Ferdinand Marcos Jr. appointed his vice president, Duterte himself declared martial law across the southern island of Mindanao and gave the army a free hand in waging war against Islamists and communists. It's three months now since a group of jihadists seized the city of Marawi. Unable to flush them out, Duterte extended military rule in Mindanao until the end of this year, using his supermajority in Congress, and mulled its extension nationwide. Four out of five Filipinos are Catholics, but despite his brutal drugs war and his calling Pope Francis a son of a whore, Duterte is more popular now than when he was elected. He has viciously attacked church leaders who've spoken out against the killings, but some still do. It's really an authoritarian dictatorial rule without even a, a formal declaration of martial law all over the country. He controls Congress and now even the police. You know, it is becoming a killing machine. You know, I believe he reflects the worst version of ourselves as Filipinos, you know. There is a Duterte in many of us, you know. Someone who can be, who lacks mercy and compassion, who is rude, who is brutal, who doesn't respect the, the law. The president's spokesman dismissed our questions as malicious. I think we need to understand where, uh, where uh, the president is coming from and the context of uh, the Filipino people. He has uh, conducted himself as really, not as a strong man, but I would say a strong leader, a firm and decisive leader who, who is not wishy-washy. He knows his issues, he knows what to do, and he goes after it. Uh, uh, very decisive and not pandering to, let's say, Western liberal perspectives. Duterte has sworn to kill those who destroy the youth of his country, but many are deeply alarmed by the direction he's taken and believe he's just addicted to killing. Jonathan Miller. Okay, so um, there's, there's uh, Rodrigo Duterte in a nutshell. Now, how did, how did he do it? How did he, how did he manage to foist himself on a nation of 100 million people? Well, that's what the book talks about. And I, 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 but by the way, I don't know if you, did, did, uh, if those who follow sort of global news, did you see that this guy, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, was elected president of Brazil just about a week ago? 
Um, and, and everyone was, was uh, comparing Bolsonaro to Donald Trump. I mean, here, you know, he talked about draining the swamp and, and all that. But he also talked about, he glorified the military and past dictators, and he talked about uh, how he would like to summarily execute criminals and uh, shoot his uh, political foes. And he made uh, a really, really bad taste joke about a congresswoman on camera saying that, in his view, that she was unworthy of being being raped, and he said, if my son was gay, I don't think I could love him, and, and everyone said, oh, he's just like Trump, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I've just spent, I've spent a year inside the head of this guy, and he's cloned himself. Bolsonaro is, 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 is straight out of Duterte's own copybook. Duterte had the same appeal as Bolsonaro in that he, he was a strong man who had, as, as I said in that piece, this sort of like swagger, which people loved. But the whole thing is an act. Now, I know that there are Filipinos, maybe some here, who would disagree with me. But I would, uh, what, I've, what I've learned in writing this book is that, is that um, Rodrigo Duterte claimed to have come from the slums of Davao with his rough language. It was nonsense. His father was the governor of Davao. He had a privileged upbringing. He was a spoiled brat. The reason he learned how to speak like he did and learned how to leer at women and drink and love guns was because he used to hang out with his own personal bodyguard and their mates. That's how he foisted on, on him, himself on the Philippines, pretending to be a bugoy, a hoodlum. And they loved him for that, because it, it, it felt honest and, and ordinary. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a myth. It was his own contrived mythology. The second thing he did is he lied about Davao City, the city he ruled for 22 years. He called it, in his election campaign, Exhibit A. He said, I will do for the Philippines what I did in Davao City. Now, anybody who knew it, knew what he actually had done in Davao City, would have had the fear of God in them. Because in Davao City, he ran the place in a reign of terror using death squads. He corrupted the local police. The, the heinous crimes division of the local police, in fact, was used as the, 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 the Davao death squad, who contracted freelance hitmen to work with them. And I know this because I've talked to two of them, including the head of the Davao death squad. Uh, they both turned whistleblowers. And in, 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 the, in his seven terms, there were 1,400 unsolved murders, many of them street kids, addicts, petty criminals. And um, he claimed in his election campaign for the presidency that Davao had been transformed. It was an oasis of peace. Um, the, the, the murders no longer happened, and neither did the rapes. That, too, was nonsense. Davao City remains today the murder capital of the Philippines and the rape capital of the Philippines. There was a woman I met uh, in, in, in the course of my journalism down in Davao City called Clarita Alia, who'd lost four of her sons to the death squads, one after another, year, year on year. And she said to me, in tears, you know, I saw this coming. I could see it. I just wished people had listened to me. I, I, I warned them. I saw them. It's Duterte. And she blamed Duterte for what had happened in Davao. And she saw that what was happening in the Philippines now was exactly the same. And the other lie that he, he told the Philippine people was about the drugs war. Um, the, the lies about the statistics. Uh, there was this absolutely glaring disparity now between the official statistics and the independent estimates of those killed. And the sheer scale is, is undeniable, though, of, of, of the deaths. Um, I'm originally, you probably can't hear it in my accent, but I, I'm, a fish, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Northern Ireland. And in Northern Ireland, I made a film years ago for, for, for CNN, a documentary. And um, as, a, as a gift, one of, the, one of the other journalists I was working with gave me this book called Lost Lives. It's a great big thick tome. And it, and, it, and it goes through the lives of every single person who was killed in 30 years of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And it's such a moving book. And it really, give, it really humanizes the statistics of fatality in Northern Ireland. And um, the, uh, the, the, the numbers killed in Northern Ireland over 30 years. And, you know, don't forget, this dominated the headlines, not just in the UK, but often around the world as well. 
The numbers killed were 3,600 in 30 years. In 18 months, Duterte killed three times that many. So that, that's, that's a measure of the scale of it. And the former president of Colombia, um, Cesar Gaviria, who had been in charge of the mission to hunt down Pablo Escobar in, in, in the early 90s uh, and ran a brutal drugs war there in which many hundreds and thousands of people were killed. Uh, he wrote a, a think piece, an opinion piece in the New York Times in, um, when would it have been? Uh, er, early, early 2017. Um, so so he, he wrote, President Duterte, you are repeating my mistakes. And he said a drugs war, a war, a, 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 a war against drugs is always a war against the people. Don't do what I did. And Duterte called him an idiot and carried on. What does Duterte want? Well, he wants to stay in power. Um, he's lining up his daughter already to do that. Um, the, 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 the writer, Mar um, Florence, is trying to, to suggest that I, 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 I belt up soon, but I just want to finish on one thing, which is, um, when I was writing this book, I, 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 I remembered a, a quotation from, from the writer Margaret Atwood, uh, who in her book The Handmaid's Tale, and some of you will have seen the, 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 the television um, screenplays on that um, recently, um, she, she wrote these words, which I thought were, 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 were very opposite to the Philippines, because the Philippine, in the Philippines, you know, unless you're poor and living in the slums, you don't come into direct contact with that. The, the educated, the elites, the, the, the professionals, you know, you'll, you'll see a few pictures in the papers or reports in the papers sometimes, but by and large, it's confined to the slums. And I've gone into those slums in this book and, and write about them. Um, but, but Margaret Atwood wrote, we lived as usual by ignoring. Ignoring isn't the same as ignorance. You have to work at it. Nothing changes instantaneously. In a gradually heating bathtub, you'd be boiled to death before you knew it. There were stories in the newspapers, of course. Corpses and ditches. And that, to me, is what's happening in the Philippines today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was uh, fascinating. If I may, I'll take the, the first uh, question. Um, asking you your explanation and your understanding of this really strange man. I mean, he sounds like a psychopath. Did you ask uh, a psychiatrist what can, because he's a serial killer, he's, he's, he seems to have a thirst for uh, blood, and uh, maybe a bit of background of his family, how, how does he behave with his people, I mean, the man, who, who is he? And then after that, how come, despite all the horrors that you described, is he still so popular with the Filipino people? They're not stupid. What do they like in him and what makes them forgive all this uh, horrendous sight? Okay, look, let me, let me start, Florence, with, with um, both absolutely spot-on questions, which, which um, had I had more time, I would have gone into this because you know, it's fascinating what, 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 what draws people to Duterte, and I, and I did try to understand that. I think you know, he does make Filipinos proud of, of, of their nation after years of this feckless liberal leadership um, to, to stand up and 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 to, to be critical of of the of, of America, the former colonial ruler. I mean, I, yes, he called Duterte as a son of a whore. Um, he called uh, Obama son of a whore. But it wasn't just that. He he basically said, "Look, America, you did really really bad things when you were our colonial ruler." And he talked about the massacres in in in, in Mindanao, and 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 it was all true. And and he he named stuff, which which was important to to Filipinos. Um, on. Uh, and, and that's by no means the, the, the only thing. I mean, he has promised a lot of things like um, infrastructure, and he's gone to China to, 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 to get investments in, in infrastructure, which is terribly badly needed in the Philippines. Uh, but um, as one of his political um, nemeses in, in, in um, Davao told me, um, when he was mayor, Duterte was not known for his infrastructure projects. Um, so uh, on, on the personality front, on the psych psychosis issue, um, here's, here's something. I, 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 it's indulgent, I know, to read from my own book, but it, it's, it's better. That it, it's, it's more succinct than me rambling up here about it myself. Um, when, when, um, it, okay, so 
Philippines is a very Catholic country. It's, it's, it, you can't get divorced in the Philippines. So you get marriages annulled, and his marriage was annulled to his, his, his wife, Elizabeth Zimmerman, um, I think way back in 1998. And in the course of doing this, she had to apply to a psychiatrist to do a, uh, a psychiatric appraisal of the man that she was trying to have her marriage annulled with. So um, the one she, she went for was, was, was a woman called Dr. Natividad Diane. And she was the former head of the World Council, International Council of Psychologists. So she was, a, she was, she was renowned in her own field. And here's what she wrote. And th this, this, by the way, is a court document. And when it began to leak out in the run-up to the presidential election uh, two years ago, some Filipinos began to seriously doubt the sanity of the man they, that would then become their president. Here's what she wrote. He is suffering from a narcissistic personality disorder with aggressive features. Dr. Diane concluded, citing what she characterized as his gross indifference, insensitivity and self-centeredness, his grandiose sense of self and entitlement, his manipulative behaviors, his lies and deceits, as well as his pervasive tendency to demean, humiliate others and violate their rights and feelings. In summary, Rodrigo's personality disturbance, which constitutes his psychological incapacity, is deemed serious, incurable and with antecedents. The full report describes Duterte as a highly impulsive individual who has difficulty controlling his urges and emotions. He's unable to reflect on the consequences of his actions for all his wrongdoings. He intends to rationalize and feel justified. Hence, he seldom feels a sense of uh, guilt or remorse. So when Filipinos read this, they were genuinely alarmed. <coughs> Very happy to take some questions from the floor. Please raise your hand and introduce yourself. Here we have two questions. Uh, the lady, well, the gentleman here, and then the older lady there. Yes, who's first? And then the mic here. Uh, if I could just speak to that last quote, um, a lot of it is consistent with the machismo displayed um, in the Philippine culture. A lot of it is to do um, with how men are perceived, and its misogynism is quite accepted. Um, misogyny is quite accepted. Um, he portrays himself as a father figure and you just basically forgive everything that he, they do. Um, I think one of the things that you haven't spoken to it, if you could say a few words, is this unholy alliance with selling off territory to China in place of funding. Um, but you haven't really spoken about that. Could you say about the West Philippine Sea, the exploration, the, the deals, the, stat, the state of immigration, of mass immigration into the Philippines from China, undocumented and all of that? It's an interesting topic. It, it is, and I can see that it's particularly pertinent to you geographically here in Hong yeah. Kong. I mean, I mean, the first state visit that Duterte made when he became president was to China, and he brought with him um, two of Marcos's own offspring, um, and he he scored massive deals. You know, he he did really really well. Um, he 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 got all sorts of infrastructure investment promised, millions and millions of dollars worth. Um, and um, as as I think France said by way of introduction, uh, Xi Jinping is 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 travelling there next month. He d he did actually do the same thing with with uh, with um, Shinzo Abe. He 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 went pretty early on down to uh, the Philippines and um, also scored investment deals there. There was a, there was a real sort of like turning back to Asia sense with with Duterte and turning his back. On, on Philippines' long-term uh, allies, particularly America, of course. Um, with, with, with the geopolitics, it, it's, it's particularly interesting because, um, you know, I spend half my life um, in, uh, as, as, a, as a correspondent out here sort of um, bracing myself for, for, for um, confrontation or, or, uh, in, in the South China Sea, which, which is a, a real flashpoint, as we all know, uh, with so many competing claims to, to, to the um, islands and atolls there. Um, and as, as we also know, China claims all of it. Um, however, the Philippines, under the previous government, had challenged China's claims, and uh, in in what they call the West Philippine Sea, particularly around an area called Scarborough Reef, which is only like I think it's about 90 miles off Luzon, and um, the the international tribunal in The Hague had come down very firmly on the side of the Philippines, saying that th this, is, this is Philippine maritime territory. And it, it, um, it threw China's claims out completely. But when Duterte came in, he said, nah, 
doesn't matter. Um, you know, let's ignore that because we'll, we, we can get into bed with the Philippines. We can, we can, we can, we can join together and, and exploit the potential oil and gas reserves that lie there jointly. And a lot of Filipinos are thinking, hang on, we, we've just had this amazing victory in the in international court over our, uh, over our territorial claims, and he can't just give it away like that, but, but he did. And, and people became very suspicious of this, and, and, and of some sort of conspiracy going on about Chinese investment, and what, 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 is, what has Duterte said to Xi Jinping to, that, that, that would allow him to, 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 to do this? So, and it's never become clear, but it may do in time. Thank you. Next question. Yes, yeah. Please don't forget to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you. That was a fascinating talk. My name is John Antweiler. I'm a retired banker. Uh, and as many people in banking and finance um, in Hong Kong, um, I, I've had a number of Filipina um, helpers. Consistently, they are 100% behind Duterte. So you've talked a little bit when you're talking to Florence's first question about the mass of, of uh, Filipinos. Um, but looking just at a subset here in Hong Kong and uh, how the, the Philippine domestic helpers um, feel, why would they have so much support for this, this monster? Um, as, as you characterize them? It, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. I'm really glad you asked it. I was yesterday down at the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank headquarters here in Hong Kong, and I don't know, I, mean, I, I imagine it's all very familiar with everybody who lives here, but the sheer number of Filipina domestic workers who just hang out there, and you can hear their babble. So, you know, it's, it's fantastic. There's this chorus of Tagalog, which, which is distinctive from, from, from the Chinese around you, and there they are sitting in, in, in hundreds, um, having, having a good gossip about about the week, and um, and it's not just around HSBC. I mean, I, I notice it on in the side streets and little little alco alcoves off off the roads. They sit around picnicking and talking, and the Filipino off uh, they're, they're they're called um, OFWs, overseas Filipino workers. That's what they're known as in the Philippines, and um, the OFW community numbers internationally more than four million. Um, and they don't include, it's, it's not just sort of maids and, and, and domestic workers, it's, it's often mariners as well, so there's men involved in this and they, they sail the world. And Duterte very shrewdly realized that this was a vote base worth capitalizing on, and he set out to, to, to tempt them into his realm. And of course, what these people do is they, they, they keep in touch with their loved ones back home on, on social media, particularly Facebook. Facebook in the Philippines, I mean, it's, it's one of the most socially connected countries in the world, despite the appalling internet speeds. Uh, Filipinos do Facebook like I've seen nowhere else. And so Duterte tapped into this. And he got their votes. And he did so by promising them that he would keep their people safe. All those little kids who they left behind in the villages and towns scattered throughout this huge archipelago, he said, I'll keep them safe. Again, he lied because those are the very people who are not only being tempted into drugs, but are now being shot dead by vigilante killers around the slums and shanties right across the Philippines. But Everywhere Duterte goes on his travels, he makes sure to tap in or to tune in with the local OFW population. He's done so here in Hong Kong. He does it in the Middle East. He recently, uh, someone reminded me uh, a couple of nights ago that he'd, he'd, he'd fought the case of a Filipino maid who'd, who'd been convicted of some crime in, in, in Kuwait. Um, he's got form in this because when he was mayor of Davao City, he very much, he very strongly fought the case. I don't know if you remember way back in gosh, it must have been 1988, there was a, there was a, a Filipino maid in the Philippines, uh, in um, Singapore, called Flor Contemplacion. And Flor Contemplacion was accused and convicted of a double murder. And there were serious questions over the conviction. Um, and Duterte made this his, his raison d'etre for ages. He, 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 he stood on the streets of Davao City Hall as, as a recently elected mayor, and he publicly burned the, the, the Singapore flag. And the Singaporeans have been rather dubious about him ever since. But, but, but you know, he, 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 that, that is actually what launched his, his career nationally as a politician. It made people across the Philippines conscious of this guy. He's, it was a po 
populist act. It was a popular act. And I think he has, he has, he has sought to try to um, gain the trust of Filipino workers across the world. But what I find really interesting is that while I had an argument yesterday with one of these Filipino maids who absolutely disagreed with everything I'd written, she, she bought the book, which was wonderful, um, but, but she, and I had to stop myself because I, I just felt that she, I mean, she was from Davao. So in some ways I just have to say, well, look, I'm not going to argue with you. So, um, you know, but I, I, I just disagree. Um, uh, but, but, but what, what I would say is that, is that you know, that when, when, I, when I was at the Literary Festival, the, the evening after, or the, that evening after the, the actual talk, um, three women came up to me, all of them based in Hong Kong, and they run a union for overseas Filipino workers. And all of them felt that what was in this book was right. And that, they, that, that the wool had been pulled over the eyes of the, of the overseas Filipino workers here. So I, I don't think I'm alone in feeling this. Great, thank you. Yes, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Wasserstrom, and um, I loved your run through the sort of strongman bullies of the world and these sort of mix and match sort of toolkit that different ones have. And you can find some that are much more slick. Victor Orban doesn't come off as a bully, he comes off much more sort of slickly, like arguably Xi Jinping does, with appeals to attacking corruption. There were some echoes of many places, many places, many leaders. But the one you didn't mention that I kept thinking of was Vladimir Putin. When you think about the kind of machismo, you also think about the playing to a nostalgia for what we would have thought of was a kind of irrecon um, irredeemable tyrant of the past with the kind of play to Stalin. And I think the this sort of pres self-presentation as a kind of um, macho figure. So I just wondered if that was something yeah, you thought about as you're, well. You're, you're spot on, Jeff. I mean, I, you know, there's a body language thing going on there. I mean, I, I, one of the fascinating things about, about Duterte is that he doesn't, you know, when he, when he comes into a room, he doesn't have this sort of like big presence or anything. He sort of slouches in with this sort of like Putin-esque sort of like, don't give a shit, you know. And, and he, he, that's the way he presents himself. And, and, and he, he'll, he'll sit down and just sort of like skulk and listen quietly, and people are sort of like, oh my god, what's he thinking, you know? And, 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 and then he'll come out with some sort of um, threat to kill lots of people. Um, but, you know, he, when, when, I was, when I was at a, one of these news conferences in Davao in uh, 2016, at the end of 2016, in fact, it was the one in which he bestowed on me this honorific putang ina, which I don't know if anybody knows what uh, the Tagalog putang ina translates as, but it basically means son of a whore. Um, and I had asked him a question about human rights, which he, which he didn't like, and about the death squads. He had just come back that night, and bless him, he was probably a bit jet-lagged from crossing the Pacific, but he'd just come back from, a, from, a, from an Asian, pan-Asian meeting, um, at which Putin was there, and he declared at that press conference Putin to, have been, to, to, to be his hero. So I think he, he, he looks across the world at look, people he can model himself on, and, and star-wise, and he certainly, it's, he certainly has, a, has several things in common with Vladimir Putin. Thanks. We have almost finished. Oh, sorry, I promised one question there, and I'm sorry, we'll have to finish after that. Um, the mic here at the last uh, table. Hi. Afternoon. Hi. Um, yeah, I travel to Philippines, mainly Metro Manila, <clears throat> quite regularly these last two years. Uh, my personal opinion from talking to people, um, normal people around the streets, is a 50-50 split. 50% 50 of the people um, seem to like Duterte, um, like in terms of his policies in regard to infrastructure investment, what he's doing in terms of um, his build, build, build policy, for example, his deals with China, as you mentioned, Japan, and also Korea, um, not just in Metro Manila, but north of Philippines and south of Philippines in Mindanao. <coughs> Excuse me. And the other 50% of the people, um, it's not, they don't like him, it's, it's a hatred. And when I dig a little bit deeper into the other 50%, uh, that 50% is they've been personally affected by, by Duterte's drug war policy. Um, so I suppose the point I'm trying to make is, I think Duterte from one side, Filipino people support him in terms of his infrastructure, but if he's been personally affected, 
I think that that's the side where there's real anger and hatred, and it and it really does seem anger and hatred. So maybe that's not really a question we can take. A I, I, I could oh. just speak to that very briefly. Okay. I mean, look, yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I had a funny experience the other night trying to explain to a Taiwanese friend uh, what marmite is. Um, but um, for, the, for those who don't know, it's a yeast spread, which which um, uh, I think comes out of the UK. But you either love it or loathe it. Um, I I'm I'm in the latter camp, but. Duterte is a Marmite politician, and he splits people right down the middle. He's very polarizing. And uh, the, the interesting thing is, though, that, that among the people who've been the victims of his drugs war, among the very poorest part of society um, are people who voted for him because they believed in th th that he was one of theirs. And they're the ones who, who, who've had the wool pulled, up, pulled over their eyes. But it, it always surprised me how even educated, I, I hesitate to say elite, but you know, professional people who, who are really well educated, were, 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 they were reserving judgment for quite a long time about Duterte because he, he, he seemed to be inclusive. He seemed to be drawing Marxists into his government of national unity, supposedly, to, to do agrarian reform, which was so badly needed. He was promising these great infrastructural investment projects and build, build, build. But his 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 notion of Duterteonomics, as it's been dubbed, um, is is run not by him, but by his his his, his underlings. And um, you know, there, there are there are those who say to me that basically the the um, economy of the Philippines, which is growing really steadily, is growing d um, despite him, not because of him. Fantastic. Well, I think we'll finish with the Marmite image. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan Miller, for this fantastic talk, and I uh, hope to see you again soon here in Nantes, back in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much.